Good afternoon and welcome to Taking Your Financial Services Firm to the Next Level. I'm Hilary Fiorella. I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Center at the American College of Financial Services, and we're pleased that you're joining us today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Stacey McKinnon, Chief Operating Officer at Morton Capital. Stacy joined Morton Capital in Calabasas, California in 2014. She's part of the executive management team, and she also oversees internal and external operations, including client experience, service offering, marketing, and business operations. Stacy graduated from the University of California, Santa Barbara in September 2007 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in business economics and religious studies. And that will probably factor into one of the questions we talk about later on, having that background in financial services. Stacy is a certified financial planner professional and holds a, 60, a Series 65 license. So Stacy, welcome and thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So hi everyone, welcome to Taking Your Firm to the Next Level. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit more about what it means to take your firm to the next level inside your organization, not just outside your organization. When we talk about growing our businesses, we oftentimes focus on profitability, client acquisition, business development, and marketing. And those are obviously very good aspects of an organization to focus on. But I propose that taking your firm to the next level actually means focusing on your employee experience so that you build up your people so that they can go to the next level with you. So that's what the presentation is going to be on today. How do you actually grow an organization from the inside out? You know, the last year has been fairly difficult for all of us, um, whether it was adapting to a remote world or just the stresses we all faced over the election, pandemic, social justice. Our people have been, you know, a part of that as well. We oftentimes think about how our clients have been impacted, but the reality is all of us went through a year where our health and wealth were both being attacked at the same time. That doesn't normally happen. And so when we think about our organizations and how to better run them, I feel like it's very important to focus on how do you build people up, give them the confidence they need so that you truly can do those other things like grow the organization, acquire more clients, focus on profitability. So the structure of today is gonna to be walking through what do you do and where do you start inside of that organization. To set a baseline, I wanna go ahead and share with you what I consider to be good firms versus great firms. So we can really talk about the journey that you should go through. So this is just a very simple chart. I'm gonna share with you a few elements to good firms and great firms. We're gonna go through growth, culture, vision, work environment, and operations. So the first thing I wanna address is growth. Oftentimes when we think about growth, we put a number on growth. Like I wanna get 10% more clients or increase my revenue by 10% or increase my AUM by 10%, whatever that looks like. It tends to be numbers focused. But the truly great firms see growth as more than a number. In our organization, we actually have the four areas of growth, revenue, relationships, personnel, and personal. And everyone in the organization has goals in terms of how they're going to help us grow in those four different areas. Because the reality is, is that if somebody is personally growing, getting their CFP, growing in their knowledge, growing in their communication style, eventually they're going to be an advisor that adds to growing in the revenue category. So we want to think about growth in all of the different areas in order to truly be a great firm. The next thing I want to address is culture. Oftentimes when we talk about culture, the first thing that comes out of our mouth is, oh, we want to have a culture where people like working together. But I would actually argue that it's much more than people working together. It's actually having a place to go to work where you feel like leadership cares about you and that they're truly invested in not only the growth of the company, but the growth of you personally and how you work together as a team. There's a lot of good resources on this. Simon Sinek has a, a great quote that says, how management chooses to treat their people affects everything for better or worse. So when we think about culture, it's a little bit less about how the team members work together and a little bit more about how leadership treats the team members. Then when we get into vision, a good firm might have a defined vision, they might have core values, but they probably announced it once. And if you asked everybody in the organization, hey, what's the vision of the company and 
how do you relate to the vision? What's your role in executing the vision? What does the vision mean to you, maybe personally and professionally? They may not be able to answer it. A great firm is a firm that can keep that vision, those core values truly alive throughout the organization. Then when we talk about work environment, which I think is a very timely topic right now, we think about how a work environment might look like, hey, does, do the, my people have all the tools they need to be successful? Do they have a computer, a mouse, a keyboard? Do they have that set up at the workplace and at home? But I think if we really think about work environments of the future, and I pr probably suspect that there'll be hybrid work environments, I think that we have to actually adapt the way we manage to those work environments too. I had an opportunity to write a white paper last year with Matt on it called the new RIA workplace, where we just explored what the hybrid work environment of the future is going to look like. And when we explore that, what we found is the biggest change to work environments is actually the way that people manage other people. In the past, we kind of adapted this presence based management where if people were sitting in front of us and we saw them working, we said, oh, they're doing a great job. They're working. But I suspect that going forward, we'll have to have much more goals based management conversations, meaning, hey, what do you need to execute this week to accomplish your goals, maybe both for the company, but your personal goals, and then checking again to say, hey, did you execute those goals? Because if we're not sitting next to each other, we have to figure out how to define and measure success in some, some way. And the truth of the matter is probably all leaders and managers should have been managing to this goals-based management style the entire time anyways, because that really helps people to be on the same page. So the great firms are not just gonna think about the work environment, but how they manage in that work environment. And the last thing I want to mention is between a good firm and a great firm is that a great firm tends to have a team where every single position understands their value, is proud of their value, contributes according to their value, and other people also contribute and appreciate each person for the value. The biggest issue I see in most organizations is actually the line in the sand between the advisors and the operations team. The advisors feel like they're bringing in the revenue, and so there's a lot of value from a dollar standpoint there, and the operations teams oftentimes feel like they're doing a lot of the work. And that line in the sand can cause a lot of conflict within the organization. So if you build a foundation of trust between all of the different aspects of your business so that maybe the advisory team say, you know what, I can't open new client accounts without somebody doing paperwork to do that, and the people that are doing the paperwork say, you know what, can't grow in my career or have career opportunities without the people who are helping grow the business and you have that mutual respect for each other, that is where I see great firms are. They truly, truly believe that they can't do it without one another. So just wanted to start with this and set that baseline of what a good firm versus a great firm looks like. So now I wanna dig in a little bit more to the content. Before I do, I'm gonna ask everybody a quick poll question because when we think about building firms from the inside out, oftentimes it starts with the relationships we have with one another. So I'm gonna put a poll question out really quickly. Hopefully everybody can see that. So the question is, how connected do you feel to the people on your team? This is a really interesting question to me because it depends on so many different factors in terms of, did you know them before you started working there? How do you feel going forward? I'm gonna go ahead and close the polls out in about five seconds here, and then I'll see if I can publish the results to everybody as well. All right. So here we go. It looks like there was a three-way tie in the polling results. People are like family. I'm as close with them as my friends, and I know the names of my spouses, partners, and potential kids and pets. But there was still almost 20% of the group that said, or a little bit more than that actually, that said that they're not very connected to their team. So let's talk for a second about what it means to be more connected to our people in our organization without feeling like we're, you know, crossing boundaries that we shouldn't cross. There's a few other things that we're also going to talk about today. So I want you to ask yourself these questions during the session. Do you feel connected to your people? Is communication excellent inside and outside the organization? And then does your team collaborate, share openly, and support one another in their personal growth? We're gonna call this the three C's, connection, communication, and collaboration. And I believe it's these three C's 
that really take your firm to that next level. We are focusing on the internal processes right now, but I, I want to just challenge you as we go through the slides today, think a little bit about the external side of the business too. How do you use these three C's to communicate with your clients? How do you build better connections with them? How, what's your communication strategy? And are you collaborating and partnering with them to achieve their goals? So I want to start with connection and I want to be a little bit more personal and vulnerable myself when I push forward these ideas on connection because there's personal connection and professional connection and we're going to tackle both of them today. So this is a timeline of my life. I was born in a small mountain town in Lake Tahoe, California. It's a beautiful place to grow up. I was spent most of my time outdoors and I think it's really defined me as being an outdoorsy person as I've gotten older. I met my husband when I was five years old. This is a picture of us on the playground. Uh, really fun story between my husband and I. We spent a lot of our earlier years skiing and racing against each other in Lake Tahoe, which was a fun way to grow up. As Hillary mentioned, I graduated from UCSB with degrees in religious studies and business economics. I feel like I got two ends of the spectrum from an educational standpoint, but I do actually feel like I use my religious studies degree a little bit more in my position today. I married my husband in 2011, his name's Marcus. We have a little golden retriever, her name is Sina. And this is what my life looks like today. While I am the chief operating officer and a wealth advisor in my organization, I also value my personal life equally and I talk about it within the company. I love paddleboarding, my husband's a DJ, we have our own garden in our backyard and we, we grow our own food. And then one of our favorite vacations to take is to the Alps where my husband is a cyclist I follow him in a car, he cycles the road, and then we, we go to the spas. That's one of my favorite things to do. This page right here represents who I am as a person. And pretty much everyone on my team knows all of these things about me. And I know most of the things about them too. I actually think this is potentially a good exercise to go through. Like have each person on your team just paint a little picture of their life. What's their timeline? What do they look like? Do they feel like knowing, do you feel like knowing them as a human will make you closer to them? And I think that it will, because then you'll be able to find areas in their life to connect on that might be outside of just the day-to-day -day business. So I want to just share this with you as an example of how you can personally connect with your team. But now I'm going to change, switch over to showing you a very quick four-minute TED Talk on how connections within an organization actually help you establish more innovation and more growth within the organization. Within the next three years, I want all the employees around the world to feel happier and more connected at work. In large corporations, employees are often unhappy, which can lead to burnout and even sometimes suicide. One of the main reasons is the lack of social engagement, and this is what I want to fight. I want to share with you my experience working in a big bank in Switzerland. In Switzerland. Don't get me wrong, I love to work, but these conditions were very stressful. I had little to no free time, I cried often, and I was usually unhappy. I wasn't really meeting anyone new, as I was always with the same employees from my department, and at lunch I would always eat alone in front of my desk or with the same colleagues from my department. So I decided to change that. I realized that if I wanted to be happy at, work, happy at work, I had to get to know people from different backgrounds and understand how the company works. So I went to different floors and asked people randomly to have lunch with me. They were very surprised, but most of the time they said yes. Once I had a legal issue for the wealth management project I was working on, and I thought, instead of looking on Google for one hour, why not have lunch with someone from the legal department? The next day we had lunch, the problem was solved, and I made a new friend. Colleagues from my department started to tell me, Marie, you just joined as an intern and you already know everyone. Can I come with you so that I can also meet new people doing lunch? Of course, I told them to join. 
And at some point, I even had lunch with the president of the bank. At the same time, I started a opening a collaborative space in Paris, where people from different backgrounds, like engineers, designers, artists, come together to meet and collaborate. And my motivation for this project was simple. I believe that everyone should have the ability to create. So I was flying every weekend to make this project happen. And I was very creative, I had lots of energy, and I thought that everyone should create. And um, creation was exponential. The more people meet, the more they discuss, the more they create. And I believe that this model could also work in bank and large corporation. So I decided to leave the banking world and university in order to create an app where employees can meet and have the option to never eat alone. And when a company has many employees, I see this as an amazing opportunity. Let's pause for a minute and think that the true size of a company is not the number of employees it has, but the connection between them. Because this is where the true strengths reside. When people connect to each other, they do things, they create things, and potentially amazing things. Big companies are starting to take care about this, because when people connect, they, be, they are more productive and are happier at work. The benefits for employees and companies are simple. It improves knowledge exchange and um, it improves knowledge exchange and collective intelligence to spark innovation. It improves talent retention. It improves employees' happiness and engagement, and it improves the internal professional network. If big companies want to attract the future generation, they need to create a workplace where they are happy and creative, and where speaking to your boss or to someone from another. Um, department is a norm rather than, than an exception. When speaking to someone from another department or to your boss is a norm rather than the exception. And for all of you who will soon graduate, think about this. What is your future employee doing so that you will be happy working with them? Thank you. So I love this presentation that she gives where she talks about the value of a company being more than a number, but the connections that it creates. And when I think about the last year and a half and what we've all gone through, there's a term that people have been using called post-traumatic growth. Meaning after we've kind of gone through what we have, what does growth look like going forward? And my belief system is our ability to connect with one another is gonna define the way that we grow within an organization. So just so that we, talk through some practical, practical elements. I wanna just go through a few just quick examples of what it means to create connections within your organization. So one way to create connections is set up peer accountability groups. Traditionally speaking, we are accountable to our manager, our supervisor. But what I've found in the last year and a half is that it's really difficult to be the, the boss behind the screen. That's not a very good way to manage people. It kind of makes for this like natural suspect, are they talking to me because they're wondering if I'm actually working, if we're in a remote environment, it doesn't usually turn out to be very beneficial. What I found to be more beneficial is actually people working with one another, their peers on their goals, and then trying to achieve those goals together and then holding each other accountable to it. I'm gonna hit on this a little bit deeper in the presentation a little bit later on too. One other way that you can create connections is care about everyone's family, whether that means giving more flexible time so that people can go to their kids' games or pick up from school and then log back on later. Or a few things that we did over the last year, we decided to close the office for a day so that people could spend the day with their families. We also sent them gift cards for iTunes so that they could watch a movie over the weekend with their family when we were in quarantine. Thinking about how a company can actually say, hey, I care about you more than just the work you do is extremely important. Create incentives that make people want to be more connected together and row in the boat together. Compensation and incentive programs are very difficult to create and there's not really a one size fits all for any organization. But I do have to say that however the compensation program is designed, that is going to dictate some level of behavior within the organization. So if you have discretionary only bonuses where you get to decide on how everybody gets paid, that gives people almost no control over their life or power or wealth accumulation. It gives a lot of the control for you as a business owner. Now it's okay to say, if we don't perform well, 
we're not going to give bonuses this year, but give people clear expectations on what you want them to achieve. And if you want them to be more connected so that they can innovate and they can grow your organizations, make sure the incentive programs actually incentivize that behavior. We also want to set an example. So when you are walking down the hallways, say hi to people within the organization, ask them a question about their personal lives, take an opportunity to personally connect. Ask questions, don't just make statements. I oftentimes see this as an issue when we have mentor mentee programs where the mentor feels like, okay, I'm just gonna tell this person everything I've ever known or learned. And then that's how they'll learn from me. I think a better way to do it is ask them questions and say, what is it that you want to learn? What is it that you need to learn? And how can I utilize my experience to help you grow in the areas you need to grow and be more successful in those ways? Value life balance and set an example for it as a leader. Invest in career pathing. One of the best ways to connect with people in your firm if you're in a leadership or management position is to help them achieve the career goals that they need to achieve, which means outlining very clearly what it means for them to get there. Share core values and why they matter to you. Maybe even develop a story around it. Our core values are our five E's, excellence, empowerment, empathy, ethical, and enjoyment. When we talk about our core values, we don't just talk about them separately. We talk about them as a whole, the persona of who Morton Capital is, and we keep them alive within the organization. Don't force fake connection. I think that's a big issue where we you know, put time on our calendar and say, well, I haven't connected with you, so I'm required to do this. I'm going to spend that 15 minutes doing it. Be authentic, which I think speaks to against fake connection. Create time in your schedule to do it. And honestly, allow personal discussions within the organization. There's been some feedback I've received that people feel like they're less distracted working from home because they don't have people periodically walking by and saying hi to them. But I think that actually might be some, a little bit damaging to organizations because if you don't have those personal connections, I'm not sure that you can feel the rowing in the boat feeling as much. Rally with people whenever they're winning and make sure you're celebrating the wins. Support them when they're losing. Anytime people make a mistake or have a loss, Think of it as a learning opportunity and help them grow from it versus um, blame or fear or anything else like that coming into play. And then start small. It can be really daunting to think about the connections that you want to make within an organization. So taking very small steps, maybe do one of the things on this list for the next two weeks and see if you can cultivate better connections within the organization. So I want to go ahead and switch to communication from connection. I'm gonna go ahead and put out another polling question really quick for the audience. While well, folks are at questions, Stacey, um, I've got a question for the audience about how to connect in the remote environment. And I think that you answered it with all of those suggestions on your last slide, um, family support, incentives, setting an example, asking questions, sharing core values, having that connection there, not using face, fake connections, being authentic, creating time, allowing for personal discussions, rallying, support when winning, supporting when losing. So um, to the person who asked that question, I think Stacy answered it. If not, please um, continue in the Q&A and we'll see if we can nail it down for you. At the end of the day, everything I put on that list, it comes down to caring about one another personally and professionally. And so if you can cultivate more of a culture where you truly do care about one another and you believe that the long-term success of your organization is dependent upon that care and authentically believe that, I think that's really how you cultivate those deeper and more meaningful relationships with people in a remote world. All right, got most of the votes in, so I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So it looks like most people landed somewhere in the middle. Not good, not bad, um, but maybe they can be improved upon. One of the things that I see, let me go ahead and close this out. One of the things that I see within organizations is that oftentimes we focus on communication in two ways, written and verbal communication. We don't always focus on nonverbal and visual communication. So we're gonna tackle just how we can think about running our organizations a little bit better in all four of these different areas of communication. 
Before I get into what makes good communication, I'm going to talk for a second about poor communication. This chart right here is from a book called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, which I highly recommend. And I just want to explain this chart really quickly. Down the center of the chart is a line. Above the line, people are open, they're curious, they want to learn, they believe that maybe even play leads to learning. Below the line, people are committed to being right, defensive, maybe protective of themselves. In the book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, it talks about how we all approach situations in our life from a place of being above the line or below the line. It's actually research that most people spend most of their time below the line. It's kind of hard to admit to ourselves that that happens, but oftentimes we just get in this place of like self-protection or security and it actually stops us from being able to communicate well. And I share this because I believe that most issues in life are due to a miscommunication, at least issues within the workplace. It's just somebody having a perception that was different than reality. But if we approached any issue that happens with an above the line mindset, meaning I'm so curious, why did that happen? What could I have done better? What could you have done better? Is there a process that's wrong? be much more successful in any kind of communication. So I wanted to just start with this idea of above the line versus below the line mindset. I'm going to show you an example now of poor communication. We're going to go ahead and use a clip from the movie The Breakup. Let me share the sound really quick. It's only about a three minute clip, but I want you to pay attention to everywhere where miscommunications happen in this clip. Is the right hander, Will Holman, the lefty. Gary? Yeah. Oh, come on. Really? You got, you got three lemons. What my baby wants, my baby gets. You know that. No, but I, I wanted 12. Baby wanted 12. Why would you want 12 lemons? Because I'm making a 12 lemon centerpiece. So no one's actually even eating them? They're just they're show lemons? Yeah. They're just show lemons. Shown in the center of the table. Glad you find that amusing, but I cannot fill a vase with only three lemons. Well, can't you just use, like, maybe a, a drinking glass? I could use a well, drinking... you can have a smaller uh, version of a centerpiece. I'm not going to use a drinking glass for our centerpiece. You know what? I got an idea. Why don't we go ahead and scratch the, the uh, centerpiece idea all together? Because the chicken that burnt my mouth could maybe use a little bit of lemon on top of it. Guess what? Now we made a better meal versus something visually nice to look at. What are you do What's happening here? What are you doing? What are you doing? I, I've got, I had such a long day on the bus. I am. I need a little bit of downtime. My feet are killing me. Come on, my feet are I'm killing exhausted. me too. I worked all day. Went to the market. I cleaned this entire condo, and then I've been cooking for the last three hours. Come on, help set the table. Sweetheart, what? you've done such a great job already. Why don't, don't you want to finish it yourself and have that personal power, that accomplishment? Set the table. Listen to me. Do you think that when Michelangelo, right, was painting the 16th chapel? That he said, hey, guys, you know, I did pretty good on the first 15 chapels, but why don't you help me design this one? And maybe you could help me, uh, give me a brush, and you guys can grab brushes, and we can all make a great chapel. Uh-uh. No, he didn't. And you want to know what the results were? A masterpiece. Okay. Um, it's, it's the Sistine Chapel, not the 16th. And I bet when Michelangelo asked for 12 brushes, they didn't bring him three. Yeah, okay. All the talking is really starting to drain me, and now... I'm going to have to watch the highlights later to see what I missed here. So obviously, this is a very funny clip from the movie The Breakup. Uh, but I think it's a really good example of miscommunications that happen all of the time in life. How often do you tell somebody something like, hey, can you pick up lemons from the store for me? And they go to the store and they pick up lemons. But you realize when they got home that you forgot to say the part about how you're making a 12 lemon centerpiece and you needed 12 lemons for it. There was actually a psychology study that was done. Um, they basically had people wait in line for a coffee machine and have somebody cut in line and see what the responses were in terms of when someone was allowed to cut in line versus not. And what they realized is that if somebody came and said, I need to cut in line because I'm late to pick up my kids. I need to cut in line because my boss needs this right away. It was a 90% positive uh, results where people got to cut in line if they use the word because in the middle of the sentence. If they didn't say because, they just said, can I cut in line, the results were far less successful. So in life, 
we have to remember that so much of the time it matters on how we explain the thing that we're asking for. It's not just stating what we need, it's stating why we need it. And I think that this clip is a good example of miscommunications on both ends, but there could have been a really easy solve for it. So I wanna talk a little bit about how that shows up in the financial services industry. Let me give you a quick example. So a typical scenario happens, a manager says, we need a new CRM, spend the next few months finding it. A team member brings back the top three CRMs in the industry. The problem is, is that that top three CRMs might not actually solve the problems that the manager was trying to solve. A much better way of asking this question is to say, please spend the next three months because our system doesn't have custom field options, the workflows aren't easy to manage, and people just aren't like utilizing the CRM the way that they need to. The result obviously is somebody spends the time finding CRMs for that fit those exact attributes, and then decisions get made more quickly. I think in our need to solve problems quickly or to try to fix things quickly, we sometimes forget to be really thoughtful about what we're actually trying to fix and the why behind it. So giving them more specific direction is gonna obviously end up in more specific results. Here's one other example that happens. And it happens on both sides of the party on this one. A team member says, I wanna be an advisor one day. And the manager says, get your CFP and shadow me and, and that's everything that you're gonna need to learn. The problem with that is that it's not specific on either end. The team member just said they wanna be an advisor, but they didn't say why they wanted to be an advisor. And the manager said, do these things, but they didn't say why they needed to do those things. A better alternative would be asking somebody if, that, that says they wanna be an advisor one day to define why. What is it that they're passionate about? What's their why behind it? If somebody has a why, they're much more likely to be successful versus just having an arbitrary goal that they feel like they should do because somebody else is doing it. The manager says, that's great, here are the steps. When we talk about gaining, an operate, gaining an understanding of operational processes, maybe starting in a client service role so you understand everything that has to happen behind the scenes to have a successful client relationship. Then getting your CFP and getting the knowledge that will help build the confidence you need to speak to people. And then maybe the firsthand experience, get a mentor or just shadow somebody, but pay attention to how they're like, confidently speaking about different topics or have built their own confidence. A team member who gets this, the alternative scenario will be much more successful than a team member that gets the typical scenario. So I wanna go ahead and switch gears for a second and talk about nonverbal communication. So verbal communication, obviously explaining yourself, talking about the specifics, that's what's key there. But the nonverbal communication matters a lot too. This is a short one minute clip from a TED talk with David J.P. Phillips. His entire 18 minute TED talk is hilarious. I totally recommend watching it, but let's just show you the one minute clip on nonverbal communication. Give me, let me give you a demonstration of how important it is. So I'll say something now and everything I say will be super positive. My facial expressions will be super positive and the way I say it will be super positive, but my hands will be saying the opposite. Are you with me? Because this requires some focus. All of you should learn more about public speaking, because if you do that, you will become better. You will grow and you will develop as a human being. People will love your presentations, listening to your arguments, and just generally loving whatever you're doing. So do yourself a great favor, learn more about this particular subject, because you'll be thanking yourself for the rest of your life. So obviously he was being dramatic in that clip, but I think it does speak to the way that we non-verbally come off, especially in a remote world where non-verbal communication is much harder to read. We need to be very thoughtful about the way that we're presenting ourselves. So I want to just ask the audience another question. What do you think counts in communicating? I'll go ahead and throw up the poll. We had a question about, we're in a regular meeting, oh, and maybe this came from the compliance person. But is there rules about communicating so that we don't cross a line when we're getting to know each other and communicate and trying to connect authentically? There are rules. We, um, I think an HR legal counsel will be the best bet for that. So I probably can't speak to it from that compliance legal counsel standpoint. But at the end of the day, Understand, understanding where someone else's boundaries are, I think is the, is the number one goal. And then making sure you have a foundation of trust. 
So asking people, hey, like how comfortable do you feel sharing about your personal life? Like, do you want to talk about your husband, your kids, your pets, whatever it is? Let other people answer that question to the, for themselves on their comfort level. And then as you build more trust within an organization, those conversations become a lot easier. I think on the professional connection standpoint, you're not really crossing a lot of boundaries. On the personal one, some people can feel like it's crossed. So ask questions before making statements is just, I think, a good rule of thumb across the board. Hopefully that answers your question. Otherwise, there are a lot of HR resources that are very good at that as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So hopefully everybody can see this. The results were that most people voted that communication is 25% verbal and 75% vocal and visual. All right, let me stop sharing the these results and I'll show you the results. So the one that got the least votes is actually the winner. I had the pleasure of sitting through some training with a group called Decker Communications. And in their training, they talked about what it actually means to have a good communication practice. 7% of communication is verbal, the information you actually say. 38% is vocal and 55% is visual. So when you're thinking about how you show up to your team, how you show up in front of clients, think through what that actually means because, and they had this quote on the, in the training, people buy on emotion and justify with fact. What you verbally say is oftentimes the facts. What they feel from what you say is how people feel more connected to you. So I think that nonverbal communication is actually a connection tactic and a communication tactic. One other thing that they did in this training is they talked about the behaviors of trust. So when it comes to nonverbal communication, what can you actually do to help strengthen your capabilities. Things like eye communication, your posture, gestures, are you smiling? Is your voice you know, cracking or is it confident? Or is it maybe just somewhere in between where it feels like authentic and humble and approachable? And then how you dress and appear. All of these things are super important when it comes to nonverbal communication. All right, so let's switch gears for a second, go into written communication. I'm just going to go really quickly over this because obviously grammar plays a role here, how well you storytell, but when it comes to how you're working on your organization, there's actually little things that I think break communication or cause below the line behavior. Here's a quick example. Two questions, same question. One is written with a please and the other one and in not all caps and the other one's in caps. The thing that's important to realize here is that the energy you put out is going to be the energy you receive back. Life is one big boomerang. Whatever energy you're giving to people is probably the energy you're giving back. So if you're giving aggressive all caps energy to somebody, you'll probably get aggressive all caps energy back. So when we think about written communication, make sure that you're approaching people in the way that you want them to approach you back. Second example of written communication, this happens a lot in our new world, our new Zoom world. And here's just a quick screenshot of a Zoom meeting where Mike Morton messaged me a question, do you have a moment? But there's two things that, in my opinion, are wrong with the way this question is written. Number one, I'm on a Zoom meeting. So I don't have a green light. I am already in a meeting. I obviously do not have a moment right now. The second thing is that they messaged me two minutes before the end of the day. So this happens all of the time and people are busy. And I think it's also up to me to not be offended by this, but there's a reality to it. This could be, could be done in a much better way that could help our personal relationship and help the way that we're communicating to each other. So here's an example, acknowledge I'm on a call and then it's the end of the day. Let me know specifically what you want me to talk, talk to me about. So I know if it's time sensitive or not. And then if, let me off the hook. If I don't have time, you'll schedule a time on my calendar. I think honoring other people's time is one of the most important things when we think about how we're working together as a team going forward. All right, I'm going to switch gears into visual and written communication. So when we talk about career pathing, which is one of the ways to connect better with people, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's not just verbal. It's going to be able to speak to people's different learning styles. So this is a chart of our career paths at our organization. And we did two things. We wanted to write everything down to make it very clear that there's other paths that they can go down. But then we also wanted to make it visually appealing. I feel like as soon as you add colors and design, and when you're especially, especially when you're designing for your team, 
you're telling them it's important to you that they get the best. And that's why you've added some visual communication and written communication together. So I just thought I'd share this as a quick example. And then when it gets into visual communication and your external marketing, it's also very important. We ran a series in 2019 called Financial Bites, where we invited people into our offices for lunch and learns. It's a very fun series. When we were designing the visuals for this, though, it was actually way more detailed than you even think about. We went through what it meant to activate the senses. We, met, we went through some questions around, like, what's our brand as a company and how does this play out in Financial Bites? Our firm uh, manages over a thousand clients, about two and a half billion in assets. And we think of ourselves as a farm to table restaurant versus a traditional steakhouse. We do a lot of alternative investments. So when we talk about alternative investments to our clients, we compare it to going out to the farmer's market, seeing what's in season, and then adding investments to our client portfolios that are just in season. And they might be there for a period of time or they might stay forever, but it's not just the traditional kind of stock and bond portfolio. So we wanted to play off this analogy that we often talk about when we talk about our company in this Financial Bites series. We also wanted to think about coloring and tactile design. And we went ahead and chose these colors as the colors that we wanted to create for some of our materials. Yellow and its happiness, maybe orange and passion, authentic. Purple, I think is really nice, luxurious, captivating. Green has, has an attitude of like nature and energy. And the result was we created these five different brochures that asked our clients to come and enjoy the education sessions we were doing, but then also bringing food into it as well. So I think when you visually communicate, the most important thing here to be said is that it is a statement about how proud you are of yourself and the quality that you're gonna bring out for them. I think we have to remember in all forms of communication that oftentimes people feel how you do one thing is how you'll do everything. And so putting your best foot forward in all of these different areas is important as you grow your organization. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the last topic, which is collaborating together. There's just this nice quote by Henry Ford. When we talk about collaboration, I think there's really three areas that exist within an organization. The manager leader, manager or leader and employee, firm-wide and employee to employee. I just wanna start with how managers or leaders collaborate with their employees. And we're gonna go ahead and put the last polling question up now. All right, so question for everybody. Do you have a career path with clear expectations to achieve your goals? This is oftentimes the number one ways that managers or leaders interact with their employees. And I'll share the results. I'm, I'm very happy to see that most people have a career path that is exactly what they need to do and that their manager is 100% supportive. That is such great news. Although the other answers here, it's basically that people do have career paths, but they're not specific enough or they're not formal enough to truly help them to get to where they want to go in their career. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to build a more specific career path. So one of the things that we do in our organization is survey our team members before we do any career path meetings so that they can have a voice in what the future of their career looks like. We ask them to rank their favorite activities within the organization so that we can get a better idea of what they enjoy doing versus what they don't enjoy doing. You know, there's two schools of thought on this. Um, you can have people do what they don't enjoy doing and help them get better, or you can take where people are naturally excellent and where they wanna add value and continue cultivating that. As organizations grow and resources become more available, I think you wanna really cater people's natural skill sets to where you want them to go in the organization. And generally speaking, there's other people that wanna do the things that that person doesn't wanna do. So we think about how to build an organizational structure that allows people to work at their best. Then we ask questions like, what are their education goals? And then when it comes to their, their career path, long-term goals, how do they wanna add value short-term? We ask if there's anything that's inhibiting them from moving forward, and then if there's anything else at their review that we wanna talk about. One of the things I love the most about this survey is it really puts ownership on career movement in the hands of the people that are gonna be working with their manager or leader to develop that career. I think too much of the time people feel like their manager or leader is in full control of how their career moves forward. And it's really beneficial to give people a little bit of power back in this process. You want them to take ownership over what they need to do to move the company forward and move their career forward. 
then what we do is we build this timeline for them. It's separated out into responsibilities and competencies, and then maybe if they're an advisor, certain revenue goals. But every six months, we meet with everyone to talk about what we, what we, whether or not they accomplished the things that we had set out, and then we usually adjust and redefine what the career path moving forward looks like. This is a custom career path. We also have generic ones in our organization. So we have the chart I showed earlier. We have details about what it means to be an associate advisor from a responsibility versus like cultural values, education, learning. And then in addition, we make these custom career path charts for each of our team members. I think this has been one of the best changes we made about three years ago because it really helps people to understand expectations and then when they don't meet the expectations, they understand why they're not moving forward. And when they do meet the expectations, it's very rewarding to help kind of celebrate the wins with them. So let me go ahead and switch to employee to employee collaboration. I talked a little bit about this earlier about peer accountability, but I'm going to share this is the last little short video on peer accountability and why it's so important. So there's sort of three types of accountability and most of us recognize that at some level we need some accountability to get us motivated. Yeah? So there's sort of the first one's the one we typically use, which is self accountability, which is where we've got to have this internal battle with ourselves to get our stuff done. And it can be really hard. So a lot of people hire a coach um, because they need someone else to sort of come and keep them accountable. But I also think that just feels like your teacher at school trying to get you to do your homework. And it's kind of a bit icky and a bit awkward. So I reckon that one of the most powerful things is peer accountability. And that's where you form into a group and you all set goals and keep each other accountable. I reckon it's the future of learning. And I think you can harness it in your teams and in your organizations to do amazing things. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how it works so you can use it for yourself. There's sort of two assumptions you can work on with how life plays out. Uh, many of the, the Harvard Business School textbooks talk about life like a train, or I use the example of a set of train tracks. A train track analogy basically says that we start here and we end at the next station and it's pretty much like a linear straight line journey in between, right? You know, there's not many things that throw us off track and there's not many things that go wrong. Is that true for you? Yes, or no? No, I hope. For most people, or I suspect no, life doesn't work that way, all right? Life is a up and down journey. And to get to here, all of us have got to at times struggle with the downs and try and leverage the ups to get to our endpoint. And so I was gonna talk about peer accountability. What's that got to do with that? Which is trying to keep yourself accountable when you're at these low points and trying to stop yourself from getting too, you know, too self-absorbed when you're at the top points is really hard. And the same with using a coach. Now a coach is very important, but you need to have other people around you so that they can support you to get back on track when you're here and they can help you use this so that that line keeps going up rather than continuing to go down. So how does it work? Basically what you do is at here you set a scorecard all right, with three or four other people in the organization and you make commitments to yourself okay, about the X, Y, Z, A, B, C, whatever it is, the four or five things that you want to achieve in the 12 months ahead. And then what you do is you aim to meet on a regular rhythm and ask yourselves two questions. What wins have you had and what do you need to get to your end goals? You can have a coach involved, but you don't necessarily need to. All you need is a system. And one of the great things about it is when you're trying to keep yourself accountable, it's hard. And when the coach is doing it, it creates tension with them. But when it's with your peers and when it's a group of three or four people you trust, it's just a great learning environment to find solutions to help you achieve what you want. So what does this mean for you? You could do a few things with this. First one is if you wanted to get three or four people that are similar to you and you wanted to uh, put them into a framework like this, you could do that amazingly successfully 
The second is, if you want to talk about. I really love how he digs into the value of working together with your peers. That's one of the biggest changes we made in the organization over the last few years, like I mentioned earlier. And we have our business development advisors. They meet once a week. They talk about what commitments they're making to pushing forward COI relationships, what revenue they got in the last week, what revenue they still have outstanding, maybe communication challenges they're facing. Maybe they had a process meeting that didn't go well, and they want to find out from their peers how to resolve that going forward. I don't go to those meetings. No managers go to those meetings. It's just peers talking to peers about how to make each other better. We do that across our operations teams, our associate advisors, and our lead advisors, and our business development advisors. And we found that this type of collaboration is really moving the firm forward much better than just having a boss say, hey, did you meet those goals? Did you meet those metrics every week? People want to work together. They want to be really in the together. Let me just go ahead and end on firm-wide collaboration. So as an organization, it's very important, like I mentioned earlier, to have a vision or a mission that everybody's going towards, but it's also very important to hear everyone's voices and how that vision or mission should play out. So two examples of things we've done in an organization, one is an innovation tournament. There's a website here that actually does it for you, where we asked all of our team members to submit ideas on how our company could be better. We ended up with 150 submissions, our leadership team narrowed it down to the top 20. We had everybody vote on the top 20. And over the last year, we've been doing a charitable committee, a mentor-mentee program, and then an investment education program. That's been a really good way for people to bring ideas to the table on how the firm and company can be better, but then also have ownership over instituting those ideas going forward. One other thing that we've been doing for probably the last five years are education sessions. Every Thursday at 10 a.m., we have a mandatory firm-wide education session where we bring in different experts or topics for our team to make them better. So that might look like a deep dive on different fund, investment funds that we're, we're using. It might look like our team members having a chance to present financial plans to the group and use case studies to help make one another better. That I find is actually a really great way to help people to get better at their communication skills when they have to actually present to the team. We also have it as an opportunity for advisors to bring in COI. So a CPA might come and talk to us about the, the latest on the proposals from Biden on tax reform, or maybe an estate attorney comes and speaks to us or somebody who specializes in 529 education planning. It's really actually a good opportunity for advisors to bring in their contacts and connections and put them in front of a big group. But then it's also a good opportunity for us to just continue having that like above the line committed to learning mindset. So everybody attends these sessions. They're happy to attend them. Nobody has a problem with attending them or feels like that hour is not time worth, worthwhile. It's very important. And then the other things we do is about every six to eight weeks, we bring in soft skills training. I mentioned that book, 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, before. We did a training session with the whole firm on that book. We've also done training sessions on books like Life Scale or The One Thing. We did a training session on how to communicate as a dialogue, not a download. As advisors, sometimes we tend to like spew out information at our clients versus dialogue with, dialoguing with them to help them to better understand it and meet them where they're at. So we incorporate all of these skills into our training session and training calendar. And at this point for our education sessions, we're booked out through the month of July. We don't even have spots available in August. So this has been a really great thing we've been doing for the last five years, and it really helps bring us all together and even make a statement as a company that education is really important to us. So in wrapping up, I just wanted to make one more comment that creating a collaborative environment is more important now than ever before, especially in this remote world. And a few reasons why. People have to feel like they're, they're rowing in the boat together. It can be very isolating and lonely at home. And I know some people are having people go to the office, some are hybrid, some are remote only, but making sure that the collaboration stays there and it's not just go home, do your tasks, and then let me know when you're done with your tasks is extremely important. I think that also speaks to burnout, which is a huge problem that we're facing across the board because people feel like they're working longer hours and they're more stressed out. When you collaborate and engage in creativity with somebody else, you oftentimes can get over that burnout hump. I think creativity and innovation can sometimes be a solve for burnout. 
And that leaves me to the last point, which is that if we don't continue to be creative and innovative, our industry might slow down. We might not accomplish and get over some of the hurdles that are really important to get over, including some of like diversity and other um, issues that are being brought to the forefront now. So I wanted to just make a quick comment that collaboration is more than just about how you work together as a team, but it's in how you actually grow that organization. So just to summarize, the best firms focus on connection, communication, and collaboration, both internally with their teams, but then externally with their clients. And from a leadership standpoint, I think this is extremely important when it comes to creating the firm that you want to create. I met with this prospect uh, who had, was a leader in her own organization. It was a nonprofit. And she told me that her favorite part about leadership was the dinner table conversations. And I, I was like, what do you mean by the dinner table conversations? And she said, my job as a leader is so that people can go home happier and have better dinner table conversations with their family. They can be more fulfilled, find more meaning in their careers. And I truly believe that if we engage people more in the workplace, they create that level of happiness, they bring that home, they're kinder people, they'll probably be kinder members in society too. We could probably make substantial change and the organization will continue to grow and you'll have people rallying around the same vision and goal as you. So that's the end of this presentation. Remember connection, communication and collaboration. I think we have a few questions in the Q&A, so I'll go ahead and switch to Q&A now. Hillary, if you wanna come back on. Thank you, Stacy. That was an amazing presentation. So one of the questions I think you answered, it was how do you sort of circumvent those informal communication channels when that may be exclusive for some people, they may not be comfortable using those informal channels. And I think your innovation tournament, your education sessions, and some of those um, company sponsored events are really great ways to get to know people. And the last question was about working remotely and wanting to continue working remotely when the rest of the office goes back. But I think that might be best handled offline via LinkedIn. You say you're open to LinkedIn questions since we are up against the hour. And I want to thank Stacy for sharing her expertise and her insights with us today. Um, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Thank you, everyone.